So Ariane Schneck um, is assistant professor at Bielefeld University. And before she came to Bielefeld, uh, she was assistant professor at Hamburg University. She holds a PhD from Humboldt University and uh, she's written on Descartes and Elizabeth of Bohemia. And she's organized um, an empowerment workshop on practical perspectives on women in philosophy um, and also uh, women's tea. Um, and um, she's the author of a popular article on Elizabeth of Bohemia, Elizabeth of Bohemia's non peripatetic account of emotions, which is published in the journal. Uh, in the British Journal for the History of uh, Philosophy. And um, we are excited to hear her talk on um, emotions and knowledge in Elizabeth of uh, Bohemia today. Um, a couple of words about um, new voices. The next talk is gonna be um, Sebastian um, Bender's uh, talk. Um, on um, the question is Anne Conway a monist and it will take place on the 29th of July and um, before that we'll have a colloquial meeting of new voices um, it's just a colloquial coming together um, at the EAPH conference in Paderborn and the meeting will be um, a hybrid meeting. Uh, people who are here are very welcome to join us in person. And we are, we are also gonna have a Zoom a streaming and this will take place on the 21st of July at 10 uh, gym time CET um, until 12.15. If you'd like to, jo uh, to join this meeting, um, you need to register for the AA, IAPH conference um, here in Paderborn and the link you can find on uh, the website of the Center for the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists. So um, now I'll uh, hand over to Ariane and um, I'm excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Clara. Um, so yeah, first, um, let me thank Clara, the organizer who put together this um, amazing series or so far amazing series and for um, yeah, inviting me here. I'm very excited to be here. Um, just to flag before I start, um, I know everyone says nowadays that what they present is work in progress. This is genuine um, work in progress, what I'm going to present here today. So it's the first time I'm giving this talk. And that means I'm very much uh, looking forward to the discussion and your um, feedback and maybe ideas um, what I can improve. Um, that said, I will share my screen with you. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yeah, great. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, without further ado, I will start right away. I mean, you see that the title of my talk is uh, Emotions and Knowledge in Elizabeth of Bohemia. And um, yeah, in the history of philosophy, emotions or passions, as they were commonly called, were often conceived of as standing in some sort of conflict with knowledge and understanding. The reason for this is that um, emotions make, seem make us less that emotions seem to make us less objective and impartial. For example, when we favor people that we like or love, um, they seem to distort the perceived value of things or persons like uh, one's partner or one's friend or children or make us act irrationally, that is against our better judgment. All these widely known concomitants of being emotionally involved with something or someone at a first glance seem to speak against a positive function of emotions for the acquisition of knowledge. However, sometimes emotions and knowledge seem to be less intention than in the scenarios just described. In daily life, we often think that emotions facilitate our understanding. For example, when we grasp certain aspects of a situation that would escape a dispassionate look 
or when listening to our feelings helps us to make better decisions or when emotions seem to drive our intellectual endeavors. So isn't wonder the starting point of all inquiry? And maybe most importantly, when our emotions indicate the value of something for us. So often only our emotional reaction makes us realize what the thing or person really means or meant to us, means or meant to us. All these examples strongly speak for a positive connection between emotions and knowledge or understanding. Given this mixed bag of phenomena, the basic question is whether emotions conflict with or conduce to understanding and knowledge. How one answers this question seems to partly hinge at the definition of emotions that we're dealing with. For instance, if we follow a broadly stoic line and conceive of emotions as wrong judgments or something the like, we might not think of them as valuable for acquiring knowledge. On the other hand, if we follow a more Aristotelian line and conceive of them, of them as appropriate reactions as long as they fit the situation at stake and are not too extreme or too little extreme given what has happened, we might think of them as useful evaluations. In addition, it seems relevant to me where the emotions are located between mind and body, if one can say between mind and body. Are they more cognitive or more bodily phenomena, for example? And what is the metaphysical background picture of the theory we're looking at in general? For example, what is the relation between mind and body that makes knowledge of the material world possible? And how do mind and body feature in self-knowledge? Of course, one could then go on and ask, what is mind, what is body, what is the self? And down goes uh, the philosophical rabbit hole. And I can tell you already now, now, now that I won't have answers to all of these questions. Um, but I think that already this very short introduction shows how deep the question about the relationship between emotions and knowledge is intertwined with other questions, epistemological ones, and especially metaphysical questions. In my talk today, I will mainly focus on how Elizabeth of Bohemia saw the relationship between emotions and knowledge. As we will see, she had a rather nuanced uh, conception of this relationship and taking a closer look at her account that differs significantly from Descartes might even provide us with insight into some of her metaphysical, mit co metaphysical commitments that she unfortunately never explicitly spelled out in the parts of the um, correspondence we know. So I will proceed as follows. I will first very briefly clarify what conception of the emotions Descartes has in mind and what kind of knowledge Descartes and Elizabeth are primarily discussing in their exchange. Then I will also very briefly present Descartes account of the role of emotions for knowledge and understanding, as I said uh, very briefly. And um, in so doing, I will focus almost exclusively on the view Descartes puts forward in the correspondence and not so much about what he writes in the later Passions of the Soul or in the earlier Meditations. After having introduced Descartes' view as a foil, I will focus on Elizabeth's claims about the relation between emotions and knowledge. As I've already mentioned, we will see that she has not only a rather nuanced view, but also that her view differs significantly from Descartes. In order to explain their diverging assessments, I will refer to their respective metaphysical background assumptions and attempt to show, I hope successfully, that and how Elizabeth's account of the relationship between emotions and knowledge is rooted in a metaphysical, in metaphysical assumptions that differ from Descartes. So in article, 70, in article 27 of the Passions of the Soul, Descartes defines what he calls passions in the following way. And I will use this definition um, since it's shorter and clearer than what he writes in the correspondence. He writes, we, might if, we may define them generally as those perceptions, sensations, or emotions of the soul, which we refer particularly to it, and which are caused, maintained, and strengthened by some movement of the spirits. The spirits are Descartes' famous animal spirits, 
little corporeal particles that circulate in our blood and are, very importantly, bodily. In Descartes' dualist account, this means that, despite their name, there's nothing spiritual about them. They are material and extended and belong to the realm of body, not of mind. Nevertheless, since they also circulate in the brain and the pineal, pineal gland, our soul notices their movements and depending on how they move, we might feel a certain emotion or passion in the soul. Article two of the passions of the soul provides the background for this view since Descartes writes there, I quote, what is a passion in the soul is usually an action in the body. Elizabeth endorses this definition in the correspondence and it is the basis for Descartes' assessment of those emotions, which I will introduce in a little bit. But before I will do so, let me first very briefly say something about the kind of knowledge they are discussing in their exchange. As has maybe become apparent in my short introduction, when thinking about emotions and knowledge, one could have theoretical or practical knowledge in mind. Emotions like, for example, curiosity, wonder, and love for wisdom often seem to play a role in our theoretical enterprises. And although Elizabeth and Descartes sometimes touch upon this kind of emotions, for example, when Elizabeth mentions a natural desire for the knowledge of the truth, the focus in the correspondence lies on practical knowledge. That is then on knowledge that is relevant for deciding and acting in daily life. In the parts of the exchange that I'm focusing on, the practical knowledge at stake is knowledge about the value of things and persons. Descartes especially sees this knowledge as very important for living a happy life. The background here is that he thinks that in order to become content, we have to determine the real value of things. So sometimes he calls it real value, just value, true value, um, but you know the, the value that they really have. And we have to judge well about these values and regulate our desires accordingly. Only once we know the true value of an object or a person can we determine how to behave towards this object in a way we won't regret later. So this is very important. Like the basic idea is that when we misjudge the value, we might act in a way that we afterwards regret. Um, and regret is very bad for contentment and happiness, so it needs to be avoided. So we have to know what the things are really worth. Of course, Descartes has a more complicated story to offer here. So for example, sometimes we can try to determine the real value and fail, but we can still be happy as long as we know that we tried hard enough. Um, but the basic point is that he thinks that we can and should try to determine these values as accurately as possible and act accordingly. When discussing how to arrive at a correct assessment of the true value of things, Descartes, at least in the correspondence, draws a rather negative picture of the emotions as often distorting our value judgments and thus being obstacles to judging well, which is, as I've just mentioned, the basis of happiness uh, in daily and practical life. The result is that the passions have to be kept in check if we want to ass assess the value of perceived goods correctly. Elizabeth, on the other hand, seems to have a more nuanced assessment of the emotions. On the one hand, she's much more skeptical than Descartes that we can judge the true value of things. Um, and we'll see shortly uh, whether uh, and if so, how the emotions um, play a role here. However, on the other hand, she grants the emotions more positive functions than Descartes in the correspondence does. In what follows, I will first present their respective views and then try to provide an account, um, provide an answer to the question of why they have this differing assessments. So I start with Descartes. Um, in the exchange with Elizabeth, Descartes repeatedly elaborates on how he conceives of the relationship between passions and knowledge. I will only provide some examples here. For instance, um, this passage where he writes that I quote, um, and you can read the quote here on the PowerPoint. Um, Often passion makes us believe that certain things are much better and more desirable than they are. 
Then when we have taken great pain to acquire them and lost in the meantime, the occasion to possess other, truer goods, the enjoyment makes us, makes us know their defects and from this arises disdain, regret and repentance. That is why the true duty of reason is to examine the just value of all goods whose acquisition seems to depend in some way on our conduct in order that we will never fail to employ all our care in trying to procure those which are in fact the most desirable. So we want the goods that are real goods, the ones that are in fact the, the ones that we should want. And then um, he gives an example how emotions or passions can um, contribute um, to a wrong assessment of the value of a, a good and uh, or an action. And his example is um, a situation where we are very, very angry and uh, revenge seems like such a good option, like the best option. But then, of course, we realize once we had our revenge, um, that this was maybe not the best idea. So the emotions presented us a certain course of action as much better than it is in fact, or than it actually is. And he says, and something similar, like in the example of anger and revenge, occurs with all other passions, for there are none which do not represent to us the good to which they tend more vividly than is merited and which do not make us imagine pleasures much greater before we possess them than we find them afterward once we have them. You know, so here he seems to say that passions always have this effect. Um, and we can see already from these two passages that he thinks that the passions interfere with and distort knowledge in the sense that they make us misperceive the value of things. We thus should control or even completely overcome them to make correct judgments about the true value of things and persons. That is why, and here I quote again, the true use of our reason in the conduct of life consists only in examining and considering without passion the value of all perfections, those of the body as much as those of the mind, that can be acquired by our conduct, in order that being ordinarily, ordinarily obliged to deprive ourselves of some of them in order to have others, so we can't have them all, we will always choose the best. That's what we want. And since those of the body are the lesser, one can say generally that there's a way to make oneself happy without them. All the same, I'm not of the opinion that we need to despise them entirely, nor even that we ought to free ourselves from having the passions. So he now takes a bit back his very strong assessment. It suffices that we render them subject to reason and when we have thus tamed them, they are sometimes the more useful, the more they tend to excess. I mean, Elizabeth and Descartes also um, discuss that in a lot in the correspondence, but I, I will leave that aside from now. But you can see that from these three passages that at least in the correspondence, Descartes does not seem to perceive of an overly positive role of the emotions for knowledge. So the goal here is to examine the value of the goods in question without passion, as this is the only way to choose what is truly good, you know, the true value, the just value. In situations in which we might not easily do so, it suffices that we rationally control and tame the passions. But this looks a bit like an inferior or second best option since he here focuses so much on doing this without passion. Okay. Um, after we've seen like what Descartes says, let's uh, look at what Elizabeth has to um, say to this uh, proposal. Um, as I've already said in the introduction, Elizabeth very strongly objects to the picture drawn by Descartes. For her, the main problem is that judging the true value of things and persons the way Descartes describes it does not seem to be possible, especially in situations where we have to weigh our own interests against those of others, figuring out the, the true or just or objective value appears tricky. And I think she has some very good points here. So how can we decide between the value of what is good for us and what is good for the others? And on which basis can we decide over competing interests? 
And how can we measure our own worth versus that of others? In what follows, I will present her critique and then discuss the role emotions might play for Elizabeth in these difficulties. So Elizabeth replies to Descartes' account in the following way in the exchange. She writes, and I quote here from the, the, um, what you see on the PowerPoint, but in order to esteem these goods in this way, the way Descartes um, uh, described it, one must, one must know them perfectly. And in order to know all those goods among which one must choose in an active life, one would need to possess an infinite science. You say that one cannot fail to be satisfied when one's conscience testifies that one has availed oneself of all the possible precautions. That's what Descartes says. That's what I um, hinted at at the beginning. He sometimes says like, when we really tried, you know, and we try, we know we tried hard enough, we can fail and then we still be, can be happy. But um, she, she um, doubts that here strongly because she says this circumstance never arrives when one misses one's mark. So if things turn out badly, it's not enough that we tell ourselves, yeah, I tried really hard. For one always changes one's mind about the things that remain to be considered. That's also something everyone knows, um, you know, saying like, I should have looked into this more. I should have thought of that. I should have done this. Um, so in order to measure contentment in accordance with the perfection causing it, it would be necessary to see clearly the value of each thing, so as to determine whether those that are useful only to us or those that render us still more useful to others are preferable. And there are other passages where she says similar things, but I um, will just give you this uh, quote for now. In this passage, she emphasizes that we just never have enough knowledge to judge the values of things and persons ac accurately. We would need an infinite science or in other passages, she calls it infinite knowledge. However, in the lines just following the passage just quoted, she adds other um, very interesting, I think, remarks that go beyond the mere lack of complete knowledge. So in the passage here, she points out, yeah, we, we can't, we don't have enough knowledge, but um, she continues saying the letter. So, um, you know, referring to the passage before where we have to decide between goods for us and goods that are good for the others, the letter, so goods that render us more useful for others or goods that are um, useful for others, seem to be esteemed by those with an excess of a humor that torments itself for others. And the former, goods that are useful only to us, by those who live only for themselves. Nevertheless, each of these sorts of persons supports their inclinations with reasons strong enough to make them each continue all their lives in the same way. It is similar with other perfections of the body and of the mind, which a tacit sentiment makes reason doors. This sentiment ought not to be called a passion because we are born with it. So tell me, if you please, just up to what point one must follow this sentiment, it being a gift of nature, and how to correct it. So in this passage, I think she makes three very important claims. So first, she seems to assume some kind of character types, so sorts of persons that have inclinations to act in specific ways. And these inclinations seem to be at least partly caused by bodily conditions. So an excess of a certain humor, for example. And interestingly, these inclinations are supported with reasons, yeah, which sounds like what we would call maybe like rationalizations today. That is like reasons that we sometimes make up in order to justify to ourselves or others why we do what we do. And she states that there is, and I think this is a very interesting point, a tacit sentiment that makes reason endorse certain goods. And this tacit sentiment is a sentiment, but it's not strictly a passion, but as she writes it, a gift of nature that we are born with. And I find it like, kind of hard to say what she has in mind here, but I think it sounds like she's thinking of some sort of 
natural egoism or maybe drive for self-preservation or something like this. And that um, importantly influences our decisions and judgments. So it influences the goods we choose because it influences our assessment of the value of these goods without us being aware of it. So that is, I think, a very interesting point that she thinks there is something, you know, that makes us decide in certain way and that influences our judgments and our behavior and we're not really aware of it. It's tacit. Inter interestingly, despite the fact that she thinks that all these phenomena influence our value judgments, so our thinking and the way we perceive things, they seem to be somehow distinct from reason or thought. We might not be aware what kind of person we are, although our type influences our thinking and behavior. And we might not consciously rationalize the actions that are grounded in us being the kind of person we are. And we definitely do not seem to be aware of the tacit sentiment she describes that also brings reason to decide for specific goods and against others. And since Descartes, um, as it sometimes happens in this exchange, does not answer her concern appropriately and does not um, answer to her request um, that she puts forward in the last passage, she repeats her point in her next letter. So she writes, um, and that's the longer um, quote here, how is one to measure the evils that one brings upon oneself for the sake of the public against the good which will accrue to the public without the evil seeming greater to us as in as much as our idea of them is more distinct. And which measure will we have for comparing those things that are not known to us equally well, such as our own merit and that of those with whom we live? A naturally arrogant person will always tip the balance in his favor and a modest one will esteem himself less than he's worth. In order to profit from the particular truth of which you speak, it is necessary to know exactly all the passions we feel and the prejudices we have, most of which are imperceptible. And here again, she insists on the one hand on these like natural character types, like the arrogant or the modest kind of person. And she emphasizes that in order to assess values correctly, we would need to know all the prejudices that we have that are unfortunately mostly imperceptible. You know, so they're there, they influence us, but they're imperceptible. Again, we see that she has phenomena in mind that we're not conscious or aware of. One might even call them subconscious, but that still significantly influence our value assessments. These phenomena do not seem to be bodily, although some of them could be caused by something bodily like humors or an excess of humors as she writes uh, in the first passage. But they also do not seem to be thoughts, at least when one follows Descartes' definition of thought as always being conscious or aware. Are they passions or something similar to passions? At least for the tacit sentiment, Elizabeth explicitly excludes the reading as a passion. And since she lists the imperceptible prejudices here in this passage next to the passions, they also do not seem to be identical with them. So what are they and um, where do they come from? Before I will try to provide an answer uh, or an attempt of an answer to these questions, I would like to bring to the fore some other aspects of Elizabeth's treatment of the relation between emotions and knowledge. As I've argued elsewhere, she objects against Descartes' ethical claim, sometimes described as neo-Stoic, that we can and should rationally control our emotions in many, not all, but many circumstances. She points out that controlling our emotions in the way Descartes demands is often not feasible and also even if we could do it, not desirable. I will just do that very briefly here, but um, because you know I've I've done that uh, in greater length elsewhere. But what she has in mind when she talks about that it's not feasible to control the emotions the way Descartes um, requests us to do are, for example, unfulfillable desires for necessary external goods like health 
and the means to live and our emotional entanglement with people close to us or people we are responsible for. So she thinks that we cannot stop desiring health if we know we cannot reach it. We cannot stop desiring a certain amount of financial support that we need to live, even if, even if we know we, we can't get it. And we cannot turn off um, our emotional ties to people we love or also a certain emotional entanglement um, with people we're responsible for. That's, of course, for her coming from a royal fam family and uh, potentially ruling family, that's always a point, you know, what is the people, what is about with the people that you are responsible for with your decisions. And when I first thought about these arguments against Descartes' ethical account, I took it that Elizabeth just has a very different conception of human nature in the sense that human beings just do not work in the way Descartes thinks they work. But now in the context of examining the relationship between emotions and knowledge, I would add that this incapacity, namely not being able to turn off these emotional reactions also has an epistemic function. It indicates the value of the goods and persons in question. We feel the way we do about essential goods and people we love because they have a particular value for us. If we would consider their value without passion or try to consider them without passion, as Descartes seems to think we should, we would most probably not gauge their importance for us correctly. So it's not unreasonable to desire goods that are necessary for our survival or to be sad when people, people who are dear to us are negatively affected. So when something bad happens to them, it indicates their value. Emotional disentanglement in these regards might neither be possible nor desirable. In addition, and again, I will just do that briefly, Elizabeth emphasizes several other ways in which the passions are conducive to understanding and knowledge. So she emphasizes that there are passions that cause us to act reasonably, you know, against the idea that passions always make us act um, irrationally. So for example, one can think of a situation where it is reasonable to act upon an emotion, for example, fear, in a dangerous situation. You know, it would not be reasonable to like not run away um, instead of like following the emotion of fear and run if there's a danger. Second, um, she thinks that the fact that we're emotionally involved in the outcome of our actions and decisions make us act and decide with more care and concern. So the idea is if it's me who is affected by my decisions and my actions, I really think about um, what I'm going to do, you know? So it leads me to inquire more about the topic or the subjects I have to decide about. You know, I want to know more about the situation so I can make the best uh, decision when I know that I either will be very happy or very sad um, depending on the outcome. And third, negative emotions like regret have a corrective function in the sense they help us to avoid making the same mistakes again. So she writes that they teach us something. So we learn something from our emotional reactions when we did something um, bad, you know, and it, it helps us to avoid making the same uh, mistakes again in the future. So these emotional reactions, or here in this case, because it's a unpleasant negative emotion, the emotional suffering increase our moral knowledge and understanding. All these remarks show that Elizabeth thinks of the passions, or at least of some of them, or in certain situations, as epistemically and morally, morally valuable. Emotions do, see, do not seem to be merely or mostly detrimental to knowledge, but can increase understanding and promote rational action. Okay, after we've seen now the different points Elizabeth makes regarding the relationship between emotions and knowledge, let's first pull some of the strands together and then try to see whether and if so how we can connect her statements on the emotions and related phenomena to her metaphysics. 
Ideally, this could first explain the differences between Descartes and Elizabeth account, and second, illuminate what we have seen from her approach so far. So I'm turning now to metaphysics or to what she says um, about uh, her metaphysical assumptions to get a better grasp on um, you know, how to understand her the different statements that we um, heard of her so far. So briefly, where are we? I started with Descartes' rather critical assessment of the role of emotions for understanding and knowledge, as well as his uh, rather optimistic assessment of our ability to control our emotions and does examine the true value of things and persons dispassionately. Elizabeth criticizes Descartes' account by referring to character traits, inclinations that come from that character traits, but also rationalizations, tacit sentiments, and imperceptible prejudices that influence and shape our conscious um, evaluations, although we're not aware of them. In addition, she emphasizes several positive functions of the emotions that are conducive to knowledge and understanding. They indicate value for us, they make us act reasonably, they make us act with greater care, and they facilitate moral understanding. However, it's not completely clear why Elizabeth has this more positive assessment of the emotions and what category the phenomena belong to that she describes as influencing our thinking while being them themselves imperceptible or tacit. In order to sketch a tentative answer to these questions, um, hopefully, I will now briefly look at the beginning of the exchange between Elizabeth and Descartes. There, as it's widely known, she formulates the so-called interaction problem. How is it in Descartes' dualist system possible that an immaterial non-extended soul and a material extended body communicate and interact? How can an immaterial mind exert causal influence on a material body? When posing the problem, Elizabeth hopes that it would help to consider the soul apart from its main attribute, thinking, even though in Descartes' account, this is hardly possible. In her first letter to Descartes, she claims that certain bodily conditions, for example, fainting, show that the soul somehow must be separable from its thinking activity. So I quote, um, you find a quote here on the PowerPoint. This is why I ask you for a more precise definition of the soul than the one that you give in your metaphysics. That is to say of its substance, separate from its action, that is from thought. For even if we were to suppose them inseparable, so the, the, the substance and uh, the action thought, which is however difficult to prove in the mother's womb and ingrained fainting spells, as are the attributes of God, we could, in considering them apart, acquire a more perfect idea of them. So the idea is, um, yeah, we, we can somehow understand the soul as a substance apart from its activity thinking. Since Descartes does not provide a satisfying answer to her critique, she goes into more detail in the next letter. Um, so Descartes, as it's known, for example, um, tries to explain or um, illustrate how he imagines interaction between um, soul and body by uh, referring to the scholastic account of heaviness. And she is um, replying to that. And she says, but I nevertheless have never been able to conceive of such an immaterial thing as anything other than a negation of matter, which cannot have any communication with it. I admit it would be easier for me, this is important, to concede matter and extension to the soul than to concede the capacity to move a body and to be moved by a body to an immaterial thing. It is altogether very difficult to understand that a soul, as you have described it, after having had the faculty and the custom of reasoning well, can lose all this by some vapors, and that, being able to subsist without the body and having nothing in common, common with it, the soul is still so governed by it. In this passage, she adds that the soul that could be seen as separable from its thinking activity, as she wrote in the letter before, might be material and or extended. This could, 
better than Descartes' dualist account, explain how soul and body can exert causal influence on each other. So in the case of moving each other, but it could also explain why the body's condition affects the way um, the so affects the soul in the way it does. So that's what I um, gather from this passage. Descartes then again does not like really reply that well to her, but instead tries to um, make um, mind-body interaction intelligible by referring to sensation. Yeah, stating that our daily experience shows us that soul and body are united, we are one thing in the human being, and are causally connected to each other. But Elizabeth is still not convinced. She writes, when Descartes says like, yeah, we can see, you know, we can feel every day uh, how we our soul, how our thinking moves the body and how our body influences our soul. And she says, I also find that the senses show me that the soul moves the body, but they teach me nothing, no more than do the understanding and the imagination of the way in which it does so. So she says, yeah, yeah, I see that, that, that it's working, but I don't understand how. For this reason, I think that there are some, that there are some properties of the soul which are unknown to us, which could perhaps overturn what your metaphysical meditations persuaded me of by such good reasoning, the non-extendedness of the soul. This doubt seems to be founded on the rule you give there. In speaking of the true and the false, that all error comes to us in forming judgments about that which we do not perceive well enough. Though extension is not necessary to thought, neither is it at all repugnant to it. And so it could be suited to some other function of the soul, which is no less essential to it. So I think that that's very interesting. At the very least, it makes one abandon the contradiction of the scholastic, that it, the soul, is both as a whole in the whole body and as a whole in each of its part. So again, yeah, she um, makes her point that the, the soul might be extended and speaks of this other functions that are known to us. If we connect this passage with the two other statements I've highlighted before um, in statements from the, the beginning of their exchange, we get the following result. The soul might be separable from what is for Descartes its main and only activity, its main and only attribute, thinking. The soul as this bare substance has properties and functions that are just as essential as thinking, but unknown to us. To exercise these functions or just have these properties, the soul might need to be extended. If the soul were extended, it would at least have one attribute in common with the body, which might alleviate the interaction problem or at least open a way to do so. Moreover, and that's what I think what she's um, pointing uh, to at, in this last sentence here, one could avoid the scholastic contradiction, as she calls it, of the soul being as a whole in the whole body and as a whole in each part. The soul would just be as a whole extended over the whole body. If this picture is what Elizabeth has in mind, it could explain a couple of the points I've made before and it would explain the differences to Descartes. Three points seem most important to me in this respect. First, Elizabeth would not be a strict dualist. Soul and body would not be really distinct in the sense of real distinction because they would share one attribute, extension. This, make, 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 this might make the idea of the interaction more plausible. I'm saying might, because of course, uh, not an easy uh, case now, but at least they have something in common or would have something in common. If she's not a strict dualist, this might also explain her more emotion-friendly assessment. The idea that our emotions are in some sense external to us because they come from the body, they come from something that is not me, and thus must be tamed and controlled, 
does not seem to fit to the account of the relationship between a soul and body that she has in mind, if that's the account she has in mind. If soul and body have at least something in common, extension, then even if the emotions are bodily, and I think that's what she would agree to, they might not be as alien to myself as they are um, for a strict dualist. It might be then reasonable to act upon them, take their value indication seriously, and assume that they have epistemically and morally valuable functions. And third, if there's material and extended body on the one hand and immaterial and extended soul on the other, that has one attribute that we're aware of, namely thought, but maybe also other functions and properties that we're not aware of, then we might have conceptual space for the inclinations, the tacit sentiments, and the imperceptible prejudices that Elizabeth writes about. They might be properties or functions of the soul that are unknown to us because they're not conscious thoughts, but since they still originate in the soul, they can influence and shape the soul's others, other aware activities, thinking, like forms of thinking, form of, forms of like conscious thinking. In this way, we could have carved out space for the phenomena she refers to when she criticizes Descartes' account of successfully determining the true value of things and persons. Yeah, so if that's correct, there might be, you know, a location um, for the, the imperceptible prejudices and the tacit sentiments that still influence our um, conscious thoughts and decisions and judgments. So to briefly conclude, um, all in all, if the account sketched is her account, it might explain her statements in the passages I highlighted, or it might at least give a way to explain them, open a way to explain them, and might also explain the difference to the Cartesian dualist assessment of the emotions. Yet, what kind of account would it be? Since she's underlining the extension, but not the materiality of the soul, I think she cannot really be a reductionist materialist, like, for example, Hobbes. Lisa Shapiro has proposed that her account might be a form of non-reductionist materialism, but unfortunately, she does not spell out what exactly she has in mind. So like Lisa Shapiro doesn't um, really say what kind of non-reductionist materialism that would be or how um, you know, she says relatively little about that. A third option might be to something closer to what Henry Moore came up with later in the century, in, uh, in the 17th century, and what was probably around as an idea already before. So Deborah Tollefson um, argues along these lines that, you know, Elizabeth knew accounts that were similar to what Moore then later published. According to Moore, the soul is an immaterial, but nonetheless extended entity that, due to its extension, has a place in the world. A soul so conceived of might be more likely to interact with an also extended body, but due to its immateriality, still has a chance for immortality after the body's decay. So you get both. It's in the world, but it still um, might be immortal because it's not material. It's just extended. And that might be maybe what Elizabeth has in mind too. However, as long as we live in the picture just sketched, our body seems to be closer to us, even after we lose it at some point, more readily a part of ourselves than it is in Descartes' dualist metaphysics. On the one hand, and that this is a point that Elizabeth makes throughout the correspondence, this implies that we can never completely escape our bodily conditions. So the bodily diseases we suffer from or our emotional turmoil. As she puts it, Despite all attempts to make oneself independent of external affairs, I quote, all that depends on the will and the course of the rest of the world is capable of unsettling one, quote end. But on the other hand, this is the case because the body and the passions or emotions it brings with it is our connection to the world and to other people. It shows their value 
and it facilitates our understanding in various and important ways. According to this picture, emotions, even if bodily, are certainly more conducive to, to than in conflict with knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>